this book, Sheikh Muhammad Mulud. And the reason for this is twofold. The first is to ensure that the scholar that we are taking from is just, is a just person. And second of all, it's to know a bit about who our teacher is. Because although this is Sheikh Muhammad Mawlud wrote this book over a hundred years ago, and he is not living with us, he becomes one of our teachers when we study the book, when we study his book. And just as we have a biological lineage, our nesab, we also have a spiritual nesab. Whenever we study something with a teacher, they become like a spiritual father to us. So just as it's important for us to know who our fathers are, who our mothers are, who, what our lineage is, and to know about the people in our lineage, it's equally important to learn about the people that are part of our spiritual lineage. So going back to the first reason about ensuring the justness of the scholar that we are taking from, whenever we study the deen with a person, or we take the deen from an author, we have to ensure that that person is just. And the reason for this is that this deen, the transmission of this religion, is preserved by the just people of every age. So when the Sahaba, who were all just, transmitted it to the Tabi'een, the just people from amongst the Tabi'een would then transmit it to the Tabi'i Tabi'een. And then from them, they would be transmitted to the next generation. And each generation would go to the just people, the people who are not only scholars, but they are also just. And by ju being just, we mean that they have implementation of that knowledge. So when looking for taking this deen and taking transmission of this deen, we not only look for people that have knowledge, have ilm, we also look for people that have amal, they have implementation, they have action based upon sound knowledge. They have implementation of the knowledge that they know. And you cannot have one without the other. You cannot have amal without ilm, and you cannot have ilm without amal. So for example, action without knowledge cannot happen even if a person is sincere, even if a person say they want to get up and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they have a sincere intention in doing that, but they don't know the conditions of prayer, and they don't know how to pray. So they have action, they're getting up and praying, but they don't have knowledge. And so that action, that amal, is considered non-existent, because it's not based upon sound knowledge. Similarly, a person with knowledge has to have implementation of that knowledge for it to actually be considered ilm. When we talk about ilm, we talk about it in an, it, that it is a, a honor, that ilm is an honor and there's a great reward in having ilm. But as long as a person does not have implementation of that ilm, it's not considered ilm, it's not considered true knowledge. So if a person, they study all of the rules of prayer, but they don't pray, or they study the hajj and they study the fasting, they study about purification of the heart. They study about the proper beliefs. But they don't have any implementation of that knowledge. It's not considered knowledge. And the ulama said that it's actually considered or called hujja. It's called a proof. And what they meant by this is that it's a proof against the person. So you may have a person that disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but out of ignorance. He doesn't know that what he is doing is wrong. On the other hand, you have a person that actually knows the deen, but he's not implementing what he knows, and so now this is a proof against him. It can be said to him, you knew what you were supposed to be doing, or you knew what you were supposed to be staying away from, and yet you did not do that. So that's why it's a proof against the person. It's called a hujja. So amal without ilm is considered non-existent, and ilm, knowledge without amal, without action, is considered a hujja. It's a proof against the person. So, going back to learning about the scholar and ensuring that he's a just person, the way we do this is by looking at his biography, seeing what other scholars have said, seeing what people of his time and later times said about him, and then through that we can understand this is in fact a just person and then we can take from him. Now, Muhammad Mawlud, rahmatullahi alayhi, is beyond being just a scholar, he's a person of deep wara, of deep piety, and of um, sincere implementation of the deen. He's also an ayah from ayatullah. 
he's a, one of the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to indicate the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything around us is an ayah. And by an ayah we mean a sign. And these signs are all indicating, are all pointing towards the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. So normally a person when they think about the signs, they think about the celestial signs, the, the stars and the moon and the sun. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also given us signs in his ibad, in his servants. So when we see pious people, when we see scholars, these are people that point us towards or remind us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the sign of a person that's close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As an example, the great Tabi'i scholar Hassan al-Basri, when he would walk into the marketplace and people, and people would look upon him, when they would look at him, they would just start making tawbah and saying astaghfirullah and doing dhikr. Because when they would see him, he would remind them about he would remind them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of his deep piety and because of his concern with ibadah and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Muhammad Mawlud is one of these ayahs, is one of these signs. And he was born around the year 1260 Hijri, during, uh, which corresponds to about 1844 of the common area, which corresponds to about 1844 of the common era. He was born in the land of Mauritania, which is a desert country and a very harsh environment. But despite the harsh environment in Mauritania, there were specific clans, tribes that were dedicated to preserving knowledge, and they were known as the Zawaya tribes. And these tribes would be primarily concerned with ilm. They would have their herds of animals, whether it was goats or sheep or cows or camels, but they would also they would just use that for subsistence and their main focus would be on preserving knowledge. It was into one of these families of the Zawaya clans that Muhammad Mawlud was born and he began his process of receiving his portion of the inheritance of the prophets, which is knowledge. He came from a long line of scholars. Seven of his fathers his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather and so forth, seven were all qadis, they were all religious judges. And so it was a position that was inherited by them because each son would be known for his knowledge and he would be chosen to be a judge. When it came to Muhammad Mawlud, he decided not to be a qadi. He did not want to be involved in disputes and solving disputes. He wanted to be focused mainly or focus his time on studying spirituality, tasawwuf, and implementing it and writing about it and also study of the Arabic language. His family is from the Yaqubiyyin in Mauritania who are descendants of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Ja'far radiallahu anhu being a Sahabi and the brother of Ali radiallahu anhuma. Muhammad Mawlud's mother was, is Maryam bint Muhammad Mawlud ibn al-Nahi who was also very knowledgeable and she was her son's first teacher. Muhammad Mawlud memorized the Quran at the hands of his mother while, still, while he was still a child. He then went on to study the science of Quranic recitation, tajweed. He studied fiqh, he studied grammar and other sciences related to the Arabic language. And during the time he spent at one of the mahdaras, one of the centers of learning in Mauritania, he became a, an excelled student, and a lot of the, the students at that school would actually prefer studying with him over the main teacher in that school. And in a very short time, Muhammad Mawlud was able to grasp the, the knowledge that was being transmitted at that school, and then he went on to establish his own school. His school became very famous, and it was filled with students, and people would come from all over Mauritania to study with him. He would also, he taught his, uh, his sons and his sons and daughters took part in um, studying and teaching. He had two sons and three uh, girls. All of his children either memorized the Quran and studied all of the, um, the, the sciences that were being taught at the centers of learnings at the Mahdaras. And they either went on to uh, become teachers or become focused mainly on um, 
worship. His son, Muhammad, memorized the Quran at seven years of, of age and then completed all of his studies, but he preferred to be engaged in ibadah rather than in teaching people. His other son, Muhammad al-Amin, became an accomplished teacher of the Quran and taught many people to memorize the Quran. He was also a qadi and a scholar who many people came to to have difficult matters of fiqh solved by him. His daughter, Umayma, memorized most of the Quran and she was actively engaged in a number of scholarly subjects. His other daughter, Khadija, had memorized the entire Quran and had a good scholarly standing. She is the mother of uh, the scholar Sheikh Sidi Ahmed ibn Ahmed Yahya, who is the sole um, surviving member of Muhammad Maulud's grandchildren. And he is um, the, the person that people who want uh, a senate, a direct senate to Muhammad Maulud for his books would go to. His last daughter, Sa'da, memorized the Quran and would teach most of the books in the Mahdara curriculum. She had excellent knowledge of the laws of inheritance. She wrote a number of poems, including one on the seerah, or the biography of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Muhammad Mawlud, rahmatullahi alayhi, spent all of his time teaching, reciting Quran, engaged in worship, and authoring text. He rarely engaged in um, discussing about matters of the dunya with people. He would always be focused on his texts, writing books, teaching, doing dhikr, or spending basic um, time in conversation with uh, guests or his family, but very basic. He was, most of his time was spent in um, teaching or in dhikr or uh, ibadah and worship. He wrote a number of texts on uh, the science of the Qur'an, um, tafsir of the Qur'an, sciences about t uh, books on tajweed of the Qur'an. <coughs> he wrote books about hadith, about mustalah al-hadith, he wrote books, a number of books on fiqh, a number of books on tazkiyah or purification of the heart, a number of books on adab, he has an entire curriculum of adab, adab of sadaqah, adab of the masjid, adab of the tongue, pro the prohibitions of the tongue, adab with the parents, adab of the prayer and so on and so forth, adab of the eating, hosting guests, seeking knowledge, and so his curriculum that he created of adab is one of the strongest curriculums that uh, is around today, not only in Mauritania, but in, t in the entire Muslim world. People from outside of Mauritania, when they see his curriculum, they recognize that it's an amazing feat that he accomplished. Because one of the things, one of the things that he was able to do in his curriculum is extract from many of the higher texts that most people do not have access to. So for example, in this book, Birul Walidain, Muhammad Maulud drew from many different tafsir of the Qur'an, many different explanations of the Qur'an, many different uh, so collections of ahadith, many different books of fiqh, that the average person, even the average student seeker of knowledge, the average talib al-ilm, uh, al may never get to the level where he has access to all of these things. So rather than wait for a person to get to the level of where they can access all of these different sources and extract those uh, portions related to that subject that they're studying, such as in this case, Birul Walidain, and then be able to implement it. You see how it could be, it's a very difficult process to get to that level, to extract the relative points, and then to put them together and start implementing them. So it would only be reserved for a select few. But what Muhammad Maulud did, as many other scholars did, they would pull out those uh, sources and create what is called mukhtasarat, abridged books. And so it would be an extract, it would be like an extract that is very potent in the sense that it, if a person studies it, they get all of what they need to know. So if you pick up his book on the prohibitions of the tongue, you get all of the major things that you need to know about the pro prohibitions of, of the tongue in studying a poem that's 120 lines. Or in the case of Birul Walidain, it's only about 80 lines. So in 80 lines, you get the majority of what you need to know about the rights of the parents. You don't have to be a master of hadith, a master of Arabic, a master of any of the sciences to get what you need to know. Another thing about Sheikh Muhammad Maulud's curriculum is because it's such a powerful extract, people that study his books, and this is recognized by fuqaha in Mauritania, by scholars and jurists in Mauritania, 
the fuqaha that go through the curriculum of study without studying his books, when compared with the scholars, the fuqaha and the ulama that have studied the books of Muhammad Maudud, there is a difference. There is a fine difference between the uh, scholars that have studied Muhammad Maudud's books and those that haven't, in that they have a very well-rounded um, understanding of those subjects that he wrote books on. And a number of people have uh, witnessed or experienced being able to engage in scholarly conversations with people well, well above them in scholarly level just by studying his books. For example, the commentator of this book that we're going to study, Sheikh Muhammad al-Hassan, who's um, a contemporary scholar in Mauritania, may Allah pre preserve him and increase him, he said that as a child, as a young child, when he was about a um, pre-teenager, he had studied Sheikh Muhammad Maudud's books and he was able to engage in conversation, in scholarly conversation, with scholars that were uh, well advanced in their studies. Because having that extract of that study, he was able to um, engage them in that conversation. And um, I myself have had the experience of being in a situation where there was a, a very high level scholar who was asked a question and um, he responded to the question and then with all of course politeness and adab I mentioned something from the line of Muhammad Mawlud's book The Prohibitions of the Tongue and this was very early on in my studies and this scholar had also studied of course Muhammad Mawlud's books but he had just uh, overlooked that point and then upon uh, reviewing that matter, he he re he returned to what um, he returned in his fatwa to what Muhammad Maulud had said. So this is a very powerful curriculum for people to study. And one of the one of my teachers, Sheikh Sadiq bin Sidina, said that his curriculum, the books of Muhammad Maulud, it's almost as if it's a, a path within itself, a tariqa, in the sense that if a person takes his entire curriculum on adab adab of the heart, adab of the tongue, adab with the parents, all of these books of adab, and they learn them properly with the teacher, and they begin to implement them, it is a uh, spiritual training that that person will be on, and it will take a long time for them to um, implement everything in there, but once they do, they will have reached a, a very solid spiritual state. So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Sheikh Muhammad Mawlud and his um, passing on this inheritance of the prophets, this, uh, uh, this knowledge that he was given, that he was able to learn and then spread out to the masses. That these books are not, these subjects are not something that's supposed to be reserved for the scholarly elite. This is knowledge that is for the masses, this is the scholar, the knowledge that's for the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is the knowledge that will get us closer to Allah